Today we're going to continue with Trust Fund Part 2. Last week, Pastor Jeff started the series with an amazing message about trust, building trust in our relationships. And um, great message. Go to mycrossroads.org if you didn't hear it. You got to get this in you because today I get the more simple topic. His was real complicated, talking about relationships with each other because, you know, it's hard to find people you trust, right? But I'm going to tell you, we can trust God, and that's what I'm going to be bringing this message with you in in Trust Fund Part 2, trusting God. Um, If you've ever been through our marriage counseling here at Crossroads Church, um, I do in the pastoral care department, I have the honor of doing most of our marriage counseling counseling. And in that, we teach, um, and this is premarital and people when they run into a rough patch and they just need some guidance, we teach the same principles. And at the very foundation of every marriage and every relationship, there are three foundational components. And uh, first is your unity of faith, you know, and then there's this, this, um, this tool called communication that has to be in order. But at the very foundation is trust, if you trust one another. There was this couple that was getting premarital counseling, and I always get to the point where I ask them, so on a scale of one to 10, how much do you trust one another? And they were sitting on the couch there, they looked at each other, and they said, I don't know, maybe a two? (laughs) And I was like, okay, we're no longer doing marriage counseling, (laughs) because you guys aren't ready to get married. And I really did, I folded up the little booklet, I put it aside, and I said, we need to talk deeply about trust and about where we're going in this relationship because I can't with a good heart perform or officiate your ceremony knowing you don't trust each other because trust, listen to me, the level of your relationship will never rise above your level of trust. Never. And so if you only trust the two, then that's the level of your relationship. You're only gonna have a two relationship. And, and literally, this is common in relationships, but it sets the level of our relationship with God as well. I've been married to my wife for 37 years this summer. And um, yeah, you guys can clap. That's a long time. Um, I, I'm looking... Yeah, I could be most of your dads in this place right now. I'm, I'm sure of it, you know. I mean, legitimately, like your dad. And so... My wife and I have had a relationship built on trust since the day we started dating. Um, And I can trust her in most ways except when it comes to jokes. Um, I have this thing I do where um, if I see a coin on the ground, I always bend over and pick it up and always put it in my pocket and say, God, thank you for your blessings. And she knows I do this. And so the other day we were filling up with gas at racetrack. I run in to use the restroom. I come out and I'm finishing up at the pump and I look down and there's coins. I start picking them up. I'm putting them in my pocket. I'm picking them up. And God, we trust. Oh, go the blessings. And I turn around and she's videoing me with her phone. (laughs) And and I said, why'd you do that? She said, I like to see you happy. (laughs) And beyond that, I trust her Totally, and so that sets the level of our relationship. I think we have like a one out of 10. We probably have a 15 relationship. It's just, it's just overflowing with, with trust. And, and it's because we're known and we become known to one another in an open way. Um, and there, there was this young man that, that, that I mentor who was talking to me about his trust issues. And really, he wasn't talking about trust issues, but that was his issue. And he was talking about his future and about what God's called him to do and how he, he, he really is just struggling with every aspect of it. And, and I told him, I said, well, 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 buddy, you need to trust God. And he's like, pastor, I believe in God and I believe God. And I turned to him and I said, but just because you believe in God and you believe God doesn't mean you trust God. There's a big difference there. And I, I began to explain it to him like this. I, tr- I believe in large hoof farm animals. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like horses and, and all that stuff that Pastor Jeff rides that he keeps claiming he's going to get me to ride one day. And I keep telling him, you know, this is the one thing I'm probably never going to do for you. <laughs> you know, anything else I'll do for you. Name anything except that. But even though I believe in them, I don't trust them. 
Like, I believe in clowns. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. I don't trust this guy. <laughs> you with me? Clowns, there's a, a one in one chance I'm not gonna trust any of you that show up dressed like a clown. I'm just not. And you can take that down <laughs> anytime you're ready. And so your belief in something doesn't mean you trust that thing. Proverbs, the third chapter, there's this scripture that addresses trust and it explains this battle taking place. Proverbs says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now, within this scripture, within that one scripture is explained the place where most of us live. You see, we exist in the tension between trusting God and leaning to our own understanding. That's where we exist. All of us exist there. You're on that scale, somewhere between I trust God completely and I'm leaning to my own understanding. And I don't know where you're at in that scale, but it, 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 it's a true scriptural position. And I, re, I really believe it's the place we find ourselves as human, as, as, as human beings, as we're just experiencing life. In Mark, the ninth chapter, it's explained um, Jesus was dealing with a young man that was demon-possessed in Mark, the ninth chapter. So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us if you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father explained, I do believe, but help my unbelief. That's exactly where we're at when it comes to believing God. When Jesus was talking to his disciples about forgiveness, how I many you know forgiveness is hard? That's a hard battle to fight. I don't care who you are, forgiveness is a hard battle to fight. Jesus is talking to his disciples about forgiveness in Luke, the 17th chapter. So watch yourself. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles looked at the Lord and said, increase our faith. Because when it comes to forgiveness, there's somewhere between that scale of trusting God and leaning to their own understanding. And you can't lean in your understanding. You know, when you think about that word lean, it means you're leaning toward that, or maybe you're even resting in your own understanding. Because here's what will happen. When you rest in your understanding, it will bring worry, doubt, and fear. Eventually, it will break you down into worry, doubt, and fear. When you trust in the Lord, you will have peace that passes understanding, and you will have favor. And so the more favor, the more trust you have, the more peace you have, that's how God wants us to live. And this is not a heaven or hell message, or are you with me? There are people going to heaven here today on every part of this scale, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've made him your, your Lord, you're going to heaven, but while you're here on earth, God wants you to be free. How many of you will get that? God wants you to be free while you're here on this earth. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to be productive with your life. He wants you to be a light in this dark world. And there are, there are three things I want to talk to you about that the enemy sets up that, that are really lies, he tells to keep us from trusting in God. And this is going out to both believers today and to those of you who are kicking the tires on faith. There are some of you here today that, that you're wondering, you know, I, I wanna serve God, I'm coming to church. And maybe you were invited by a friend, maybe you're watching online, and, and you're just kinda wondering if this is for you. And these same lies the enemy's probably telling in your mind 
It's the same lies the enemy whispers in the, in the minds of believers to keep them from experiencing the fullness that God would have us live in. And that first lie, lie is this, confusion about the atrocities in the world. We, we look around, the people in this state of mind say things like, if God is all powerful, why is the world so full of wars and hate and murder and abortion and starvation? Why, why is that happening? And our emotional response to this confusion is depression. And it can happen to any of us. You can, you can get BuzzFeed on your phone. Like you're having a great day, man. You read your Bible this morning, you prayed, you're encouraging people, and then all of a sudden you start reading the news. Next thing you know, you're depressed. It's because all that news can bring that confusion in your mind. If you've ever noticed, guys, it happens to each and every one of us. And I just wanna set this straight in your mind. If, you, if, if this is the lie that's been keeping you from trusting in God, You see, we live in a sin-cursed world. This is a sin-stricken version of what God intended the world to be. In Romans, the 12th chapter, Paul explained to the Rome, the church in Rome, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and he's referring to Adam and the sin in the garden, and death through sin, And in this way, death came to all people because all have sinned. And so we live in a world that's sin-filled. And that's the reason those atrocities happen. And you might think, well, why doesn't God do anything about it? God did do something about it. He did. He sent Jesus. Yeah. And, And we get... And those of us that know the Lord, we get a little bit of heaven on earth. We get to stand in his presence and worship him because of Jesus. We get peace that passes understanding because of Jesus. We get to live in this sin-stricken, fallen world, and we get to walk above it because, because of what Jesus has done in us. You see, this world... And all the bad things that happen globally, they're not a reflection of God. They are a reflection of the sinful nature of man. That's, that's what they are. And so get that in your mind straight. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna let the enemy lie to me about those atrocities anymore. I'm gonna trust God. The second lie the enemy tells us is, is this, condemnation. And this is, this is a big tool in the enemy's tool chest to fight you from trusting God. People in this state of mind say things like, I can't trust God because I don't deserve God's goodness. Our emotional response to condemnation is always shame. We feel shameful in the presence of God. And, and, and listen to me about shame. I want you to receive this. Shame does not tell you you made a mistake. Shame tells you that you are the mistake. Shame identifies you with your worst day. Shame identifies you with your worst choice. And let me tell you, you're not your worst choice. You're not your worst day. You're not your worst moment. That's not what you are. Don't let the enemy condemn you into that and rob that that trust in God. I like what Paul taught to the church in Romans in 8.1. He said, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's, that's where I want to live. If you feel like you don't deserve what God's blessed you with, you're feeling right. Because none of us deserve it. Can we just receive that? Turn to your neighbor and say, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. As a matter of fact, that is the definition of grace, receiving from God what you don't deserve. How many of you thank God we're not gonna get what we deserve? We're gonna get what we don't deserve. That's what the grace of God is. And how deep does this condemnation go? When you start viewing God from that perspective, it limits you. It limits you in every way. My first year here at Crossroads Church in pastoral care, 
I've been here a little over five years. My first year I served our college and, and then I went to pastoral care. That very first year, I met a man in our church that had been diagnosed with leukemia. And it wasn't the leukemia that people die from. It was the leukemia that, that you live with. So it wasn't a bad diagnosis, but boy, he just internalized that diagnosis. And he immediately um, became that diagnosis. And I'm trying to minister to him, man. I'm trying to build faith. And I knew there was a wall. Every time we would talk, he'd come to church. I'd meet him in the lobby or I'd meet him down front here. And he went to New Orleans for treatment. And without him even knowing, I took a trip down there and just walked into his room one evening. And when he saw me, his face lit up. And, and I was there to bring faith and encouragement And what I left with was a hurt heart. I'm going to tell you why. He looked at me as I began to express to him and reading the scriptures about God's healing. He looks at me and I could tell his countenance was just falling. It wasn't rising. And I told him, I said, what's what's wrong? What, What are you feeling right now? He said, Pastor, I don't deserve to be healed. I haven't been faithful to God. I don't pay my tithe. I don't attend church every time I can. And sometimes in my heart, I question God. I'm like, bro, that's who we are. We're all fallen. None of us are perfect. You've got to receive God's grace and receive what you don't deserve. You can't earn a healing. You can't earn salvation. You can't earn favor. These are free gifts from God. And I tried to convey that scripturally to him. And I wish in this moment I had this happy ending and I could point him out in the crowd. But I can't, because about a year later, he went to heaven. And you might think, well, well, he went to heaven with that attitude? Absolutely. God, God loved him and he, and he saved him. But because of living under the weight of shame and condemnation, he couldn't do anything here. There was nothing he could do. And the enemy, the enemy rendered him enabled. Just, just he, he, he disabled him to do anything for the Lord. And that's the power of condemnation and shame. And that has to break. If you're feeling that, let me tell you, that has to break in your life. Don't think you can earn salvation. Don't think you can, don't think you can earn your healing. You put your trust in God because he is God. And he is God because of the grace of God. We can, we can live beneath his favor. And yeah, you don't deserve it. And yeah, I don't deserve it. None of us deserve it but we receive it in Jesus' name. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that's not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, least anyone should boast. You are not what you did. I want you to receive this. Receive it. You are not your worst moment. You are not your struggle. You are not what you do. You are not what someone says you are. You are not... Anything except what Jesus says you are. And he says you are loved. He says you are his child. He says you are favored. And he loved you enough to die for you. That's who you are. And you can receive it. You can cast off the lie of the enemy of condemnation. The next lie that the the enemy uses against us to prevent us from trusting God is he tries to get us in a place where we blame God for things. People in this state of mind say things like, if God loved me, why did he let that happen? Our emotional response to this blame is always anger. People get angry at God because they they blame God. God for everything. And it's a human response. Do you know that when you start feeling guilty or you start feeling injustice, it's human nature to blame. It balances the scale 
between guilt and blame in your life and you try to create this balance. The more guilt you feel, the more you blame others. It starts as children and it continues as adults. And of course, God receives a lot of blame that's not his. Because who else? There's gotta be somebody to blame. And I hear a lot of Christians giving the devil too much credit as well. They'll blame the devil for everything. The only way to work and they'll have a flat tire. Oh, devil, I'll come against you. No, 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 no. You should have bought tires. (laughs) You know, I get it. I get it. You saw the wire hanging out of it. Don't blame the devil. (laughs) That's not the devil's fault. But we got to have somebody to blame. Don't blame God. Our enemy knows that if he can twist the truth enough to get you to blame God, you will not trust God. Because listen to me, you can't trust those you blame. It's impossible to trust those you blame. And as a pastor, as a friend to many of you, man, I want to let you know that I am sorry for the loss. I, I am sorry for the brokenness. I'm sorry for the abuse that you had to endure. I'm, so, I'm sorry, none of those things. You didn't deserve any of those things to happen. And and none of it was God. None of it. It was evil people, situations, circumstances beyond your control. We live in a sin-stricken world where sickness abounds. No matter what you face, no matter what you've gone through, I am so sorry. But don't allow yourself to blame God. It's not his fault. It's not. You've got to change your thinking and your view of God. And you've got to see him for who he really is. He's a good father. He's a good father. John 10.10, Jesus' words, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. It's not God's fault. We have an enemy. We have a sin-fallen world. Things happen in this world. When there's a storm in the Gulf, and it's turning up, how many storms did we have last storm season? Seemed like 70 or so, I don't know. It was like, it just seemed like every every two, two days we had a new storm. 2020, gotta love it. You think about the storm turning in the Gulf and and we start praying, God, don't let it hit here. Don't let it hit here. What we're praying is, God, let it hit somewhere else. (laughs) Destroy another community, Jesus, (laughs) not mine. Now, I know those of you that are more spiritual than me, you pray that it would dissipate. (laughs) And I do too, okay? But most of them don't dissipate because that's how the earth is created. You know that, that a third of the earth would be uninhabitable if it wasn't for those storms because the heat would build up on the equator. That's the purpose of those, that God, it keeps the balance of, of the heat in the world. And sometimes we get in the path of a storm. And in life, sometimes we get in a path of a storm. Sometimes tragedies happen, sometimes things happen, and no, 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 it's not explicable. You cannot in any way, shape, or form lean to your own understanding in those moments. You've got to trust in God in those moments. You have to. And not not blame God. And I really believe it comes down to this. This whole message comes down to this knowing the character of God. To know God is to trust God. He's a good father. And in our relationships, how how many of you trust strangers? I'm glad you all didn't raise your hand. I would have just had to leave because I I don't trust strangers. And you're like, but you're a pastor. You're supposed to trust everybody. Nope, that's a lie from the devil. (laughs) Nope, sure don't. And if you look at the level of, of intimacy that we have with each other, like my wife knows me. Like, like, like to people at Crossroads Church, I'm the guy with the white hair, the white shoes, always dressed in black, right? 
Somebody called me a reverse Oreo. I don't know <laughs> if that, that was after the first service this morning. <laughs> hey, pastor, you're a reverse Oreo. I said, okay, God, love you. I didn't know, what do you say? How do you respond? I don't know. Didn't know what to say. But I'm gonna tell you, I bounce around here and I live a life, I live a life that is abundant. I really do. But if you ever have a conversation with my wife, and she would never talk to you about this because good wives don't, don't do that, she would tell you about the tears. She would tell you about the questions that, that I grapple with because I'm somewhere on that scale. One day I will be a 10 in my trust in God. And you know what that'd be? That'd be sometime after my funeral, I can promise you that. While you're on earth, you're gonna deal with that trusting in God. You're going to. And I'm gonna tell you that it's so important that you change your view of God and that you see him as a good father. And, and here's how you do that. You learn about his nature. How do you learn about God? You have to study his word. Get in his word. I, I so love that Pastor Jeff, over the last few years, has developed a growth track here at Crossroads Church. A spiritual growth track. Pastor Brody is over our freedom growth track. I've been assigned to establish and, and, and kind of oversee our fundamentals track. Pastor Jeff personally oversees foundations. And, and it's that important to us. And we want everybody in our church to go through those growth tracks and learn about God and learn about his nature. Because to know him is to trust him. And so if, if you don't know him, you've got to get to know him. You see, because in those moments of doubt, I know what the word of God says. God's mercy endures forever. How many of y'all agree with me? That's First Chronicles 6, 34. No one is good except God. Jesus said that about the Father in Mark, the 10th chapter. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, James 1, 17. He is the Father that gives his children good gifts, Matthew 7, 11. He is the Lord that heals our disease, Psalms 103. God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing you can do to make him love you anymore. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. You just need to give up on all the trying and all the leaning into your understanding and just trust God in those moments where you don't understand. Just gotta trust God. Trust God through his sinless life, through his death on the cross, his burial and resurrection. John 1 explains it in a beautiful way. The Gospel of John, if you're ever in doubt about who God is, just take a moment, go to version, or if you have a real Bible, open that up and go to John 1 and start reading tells this beautiful story about how Jesus was with God in the beginning. He was the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he was the light among men. And you understand that God loved you enough to give up his deity and come to this earth and live a sinless life and die for us. That's how much he loves us and we have to trust him in the moments that we don't understand we have to trust him let me close with a story about seven years ago I found myself in a place I didn't want to be standing in front of about 300 people at a funeral at Bayou Blue Assembly of God, one of our great Assembly of God churches in Houma, Louisiana. Pastor Packy Thompson had opened up the church for my family to use for my brother's funeral. My brother got saved the same year I did. I was saved in 1979. And after being saved, God sent me a friend group. And I, was, I didn't have car keys yet, you know. It, it, that's just a little, a little hint for you parents 
in our kids' ministry here at KGM. Get your kids involved in church while they're young. Because once they get car keys, it's tough. My brother had car keys, you know, and he, he came to church one day and, and, and walked down to the altar and gave his life to the Lord. But I think he was caught in a moment, you know, because he left there and never, never did anything from there. He just went out and lived his own life. He was a good guy, man, really talented guy. But that, that alcoholism that runs so prevalently in our family, he, he, he got caught in that trap and it began to define every part of his life. He began to lose jobs, he lost the marriage. Next thing you know, he made a decision at about 30 years old, I'm just gonna give up and he hit the road. He caught a train going somewhere and left town and lived on the streets of, of a lot of big cities here in America. And my mom would pray for him. And my dad, we would all pray for him. And we would pray that he would come home and that God would keep him safe and that God would save him. And I stood in front of that crowd at his funeral and I told everybody present, I said, I know you are questioning what God did here and how all this happened. But my brother was right where he needed to be. On behalf of my mother and father and my two sisters, we want to thank God for the cancer that took his life. That's a strange thing to say. But my mama's greatest fear is that my brother would die in his sin somewhere in America and be buried in an unmarked grave but he came home about a year and a half before he died. He turned to his family. Hey, and then he turned to Jesus. Yes. Yes. And guess what I'll do? I'll see him when I get to heaven. Because he made his life right with God in a sincere way. About a year before he died, he was reading his Bible. He was talking to my dad about scripture. He was talking to him about his regrets. He was talking to him. He, he actually talked to his son on the phone that he hadn't spoke to in, in 15 years. And God just did a restoring work. But I'm gonna tell you, you don't trust God through that as a brother leaning into your own understanding. You could possibly blame God. You could possibly get under condemnation because, man, I didn't do enough to help him. I'm, I'm telling you, in those moments, we have one answer. God is God and we are not. And he sees the big picture and we have to trust him. We have to trust him. Romans 8, 28 says it like this. I'm closing with this scripture. And we know that all things, say all things. That means everything. Work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. When I don't understand, I'm gonna choose to trust God. Amen. Come on, give God a great hand.